Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and it's great to worship with you guys um, this morning. I work with our middle school and high school students, uh, student ministry, woohoo, Quest students. Uh, if you are a middle school or high school student, we'd love to get you connected. Uh, it's, it's an awesome privilege. Uh, and another one of the, the honors and privileges I have is I get to share from God's Word regularly here on Sunday mornings. It's amazing. I love doing it, and I'm excited to study God's Word together with you guys this morning. Uh, So let's take a moment to pray and ask for the Lord to guide our time uh, as we look at His Word and for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Heavenly Father, we come to you um, looking to hear your voice, looking to have an encounter with you, to come to know you in new ways. And Lord, we don't want to miss you. So quiet our hearts, uh, all the busyness and stress and things that are overwhelming or consuming our thoughts, help us to have a clarity of mind as we look at your word. Holy Spirit, come and fill us, fill this room, illuminate our hearts, help us to understand what you are saying. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen. So we are in the middle, moving towards the end of a series through the book of James, which is written by, we think, probably James, uh, the brother, or the half-brother of Jesus, uh, to some early Christians back in Palestine in probably the mid-50s, uh, so almost 2,000 years ago. And uh, this morning, I'm really, really excited. We're going to be in chapter 4 and moving into chapter 5. It's going to be really good. But I want to just look at a few quotes. This morning, we're going to talk about wealth and money and riches And to be honest, the church has not necessarily done a great job talking about this. It's kind of an awkward awkward thing to talk about, to talk about money. Um, But James is going to go there, and he's going to take us uh, to some deep thoughts about money. I want to just start with a few quotes uh, about wealth and money. And uh, first, by Franklin D. Roosevelt, FDR, he said that happiness is not in the mere possession of money, but it lies in the joy of achievement, in the thrill of creative effort. I like that, in the thrill of creative effort. Uh, For FDR, he's saying happiness doesn't come just from having money or the mere possession of money, although he kind of says it's part of it. But then he says it's about the pursuit, the work that you do to get money, the job. It's in the process that you find meaning and worth and value and that that is important. That's that's his perspective on wealth and money. Don't just it's not just about the end game in the bank account, but it's about the job you do, the the work, the process to get there. That's his perspective. Uh, an ancient uh, Greek philosopher, Epictetus, or Epictetus, which is an awesome name. <laughs> it has a uh, epic in the name. It's cool. He, he says that wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few wants. That wealth doesn't come from having lots of things, but it's about your desires and having maybe appropriate desires and minimizing them and not letting those drive you and overwhelm you because there's a danger to just wanting more and more and more. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said this, he said, nice, short, and sweet, he said, money often costs too much. Money often costs too much. The pursuit of it, the, the stuff we sacrifice to get it, the price is too high. The, the cost is not worth it. That's, that's his perspective. Um, John D. Rockefeller, the kind of end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s, uh, is accredited when he was asked, you know, billionaire, made a ton of money in the oil industry. When he was asked how much money is enough money, he said, just a little bit more. Just, just one more dollar. A little bit more. Um, and, you know, I think that really is where our culture's at. That's where we, some of the, the big pursuits that we have, the pressure we put on our career and, and the lives that we live, it's about money. It's about pursuing wealth and security and comfort in those means. Um, and, and I just want to take a big picture look as we think about being mature in our culture. Uh, a pastor named Peter Cesaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, he says, like looking at today's culture, worldly values, this is what he says about, um, about Western culture, specifically in America. He says first that happiness is found in having things. Happiness is found in having things. Security is found in money, power, status, and good health. And then thirdly, you should get 
all you can for yourself and as quickly as you can. And then lastly, above all, you should seek the pleasure, convenience, and comfort. All of it that you can get. Pleasure, convenience, comfort. Happiness is found in having things, security and money, power, status, good health. Like these, this is, this is the world that we live in. This is the air that we breathe, uh, the life that we just, we see all around us. And are all these things bad? No, it's not bad to want good health or to have a good job or to, to have comfort or convenience or pleasure. Those are good things for the most part, but they can become bad things, uh, and how we use them and how we pursue them. And, uh, wealth, uh, just, it's, it's a tremendous danger and riches are a danger. There's blessings that come with it as well. And so James is going to talk about this. He's going to have kind of a nuanced perspective. He's not just going to say, if you have money, that's bad. No, he's, he's not saying that. He's not condemning us for having money. Uh, but it, especially he goes after our heart and what we do with our money and what we do with our wealth and how we pursue it. That's where he is going to drive us today um, to talk about um, self-indulgence uh, and self-determination as we drive towards these things. Uh, the other day, uh, or a while back, I saw a bumper sticker on the, the car in front of me, and it said, if money is the root of all evil, why do all churches ask for it? Yeah, I, I, was, I saw it, I was like, okay, well played, clever. Like, I, I don't even have a comeback because you're in the car in front of me. It's like, okay, fine. It's a good bumper sticker. Uh, the only problem is, well, there's two problems. One, we all need money to live. We all need money. <laughs> and secondly, uh, it's a bad quote of the Bible. It's not actually what the Bible says. It's from a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul says in verse 10, he says that the, the root, sorry, uh, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not money is the root of all evil. The love of money is a root. I guess one of many possible roots to all sorts of evil. So there's a danger to money, the love of money especially, and it leads to all sorts of different evil and wickedness and brokenness in our world. We don't have to look far to, to see that. Um, we don't really know how to deal with money. We don't know uh, how to pursue it, and we often are enticed by the, the pursuit of it, and it ends up costing us too much, and it comes out of a place in our hearts, uh, I think, where we arrogantly presume upon God. We, in a, from a position of arrogance, say, this is what I want, and I'm going for it. And that's where James is going to go today, to talk about human arrogance. So before we turn to our passage, just kind of a big picture idea uh, to keep in the back of your minds is that human arrogance, not just about wealth, but, but specifically that's what we'll talk about today, human arrogance disregards God and it destroys others. But Godly humility, it leads us to recognize our human limitations and overcome the seductive power of wealth. So human arrogance as opposed to godly humility. So human arrogance, we're going to look at chapter, James chapter 4, 13 to 17. It's going to be on the screen, or you can turn there in your Bibles. Uh, James is going to talk about human arrogance leading us to a life of self-determination. Self-determination like saying, I want what I want and I'm going to go for it according to my will and my desires. So James says in verse 13, he says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while, then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James opens this paragraph with this phrase, and he's going to open our second paragraph with the same phrase, come now, and then he's going to identify such and such a person. And here he says, come now. Uh, which is kind of, in the, the Greek way, it's a colloquial way of saying, hey, listen up, listen up, pay attention. You who say, we will live, uh, and today or tomorrow we'll go and we'll th- go to this town, spend a year there, we'll make profit. So they're presuming upon their time, their planning, the wealth, the results of their actions, and they're saying, 
this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and make a make a, a profit, and it'll be fine. And uh, at first glance, it, there's not a whole lot wrong with that. Like, it's okay to make plans and uh, to say, hey, next year we're going to do this, or we're going to do this, and this is how we're going to survive and make a profit. But um, James goes after a heart issue here. Uh, the, the heart that's driving this pursuit and the way in which this person is seeking wealth and money and riches. And here, in this paragraph, James is going to talk to essentially the Christian businessman or businesswoman. The Christian who uh, wants to make a profit, is working hard and figuring out how to make their business work, and that's who he's going to talk to right here. And in the ancient world, in, in this time, uh, as there was Hellenization, which is the spread of Greek culture, there was new road systems being developed, the business was expanding, there was similar to our day globalization, like people who were used to be far apart, now there's safe travel, there's a lot of opportunity for expansion, so uh, it, it made sense. If you're a business person, you'll say, hey, we're going to go to this town, we're going we're gonna to expand, we're going to make profit, we're going to work hard at this. Uh, you know, similar to today with globalization, you know, now we have cars and aircraft and boats. Soon, hopefully, we'll have hoverboards. It'll be great. But as, as time changes, the, the way in which we go about it is it, it shifts and changes. But the bottom line, making profit, working hard, that doesn't change. That's the same thing that we're going through that they were 2,000 years ago. And James says their pursuit of wealth the human arrogance that was driving it was really destructive out of self-determination. So in verse 14, he says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And then this haunting question, what is your life? What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, but then vanishes. So these people, they were making all sorts of plans but they were doing so from a position of presuming on what they could do and not really recognizing their human limitations. Uh, they weren't really under, they presumed upon their own abilities and their desires, thinking, well, my desires are right, they're fine, my abilities to do it, I can do this. And that's what's driving them. So James asked that question, this haunting question, what is your life? You know, you live for 40, 50, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years, but what is your life? It's, in the grand scheme of things, it's maybe shorter, it goes faster than we would like. And he says that you are a vapor, a mist. And here in St. Louis, one of our favorite things about living here in St. Louis is the humidity, right? Just love the humidity, so excited for it, the, the thick feeling, like when you walk out the door and you just feel like you're swimming. Just amazing. We all love that about St. Louis. It wasn't like that uh, for them in Palestine. It was pretty dry, arid climate, uh, but they did have a few bodies of water, and there would be mist that would rise, some vapor that would come off, but then it would just really quickly evaporate and disappear. It was too dry, too arid. It, it, they didn't have this thick, wonderful, glorious St. Louis humidity and uh, fog. We, they didn't have that. It just kind of poof, disappeared. And James says, that's what your life is like. It just, it's, it, in one moment, just poof, it can be gone. We're here for a little while, but then we vanish. Uh, you know, this is a hard thing to think about, but James says a life of maturity keeps in mind our, our limits, the, the shortness of our life to number our days and to think about it. Because life, uh, it gets cut short in really tragic ways all the time, all over the globe, every day. And we, we often do not live from a perspective of knowing. And I don't know how much time I have left. I want to make the days that I have count. So James goes after our heart to say, okay, are you making plans out of arrogance, uh, not taking into account the, the limitations you have and God and his role in this? Um, you know, he, he reminds us what I think Jesus says. I think he probably has this in the back of his mind. What Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verse 34, Jesus says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I love that phrase. Sufficient for the day. It's enough. Like you have enough trouble for one day. Just think about that. 
Um, we simply don't know what the next year or week or month or hour holds. We, we just don't know. We need to make plans, but we can't presume upon human arrogance and our own ability to determine what that will look like. Uh, you know, as I was preparing, I was thinking about uh, my last year in seminary. So I graduated from Covenant Seminary a little over a year ago, last December. And my last semester, uh, I was gearing up for like a job search and finishing school. I'd been in school for like, I don't know, 20 years or some crazy amount of time. I'm so glad to be done with finishing school. So you're excited, you're preparing for what's next. And uh, so I, my last semester was a fall semester. School started in August, and so I'm kind of preparing, figuring out what life's going to look like when I, I graduate. And uh, in September, I got a phone call on a Thursday night, uh, like 7 or 8 p.m., from my stepmom. And my stepmom doesn't call me very much at all, but she doesn't call me at 7 or 8 p.m. at night. And uh, so I, I answered because I knew there's got to be a reason she's calling. And she called. And you know that time when you, you pick up the phone and you know immediately something's wrong, something's off, and you get that sinking pit in your, your stomach? Uh, I, I picked it up, and immediately I knew, oh, no, something's wrong. My stepmom was crying, and she said, Jonathan, we're, we're in the hospital right now. We're in the emergency room. Uh, your dad is not doing well. We think something's wrong. And uh, we think he had a blood clot in his leg. We're not sure, but we're, we're doing all these tests, so be praying. We'll stay in touch. And she called me back maybe a half hour, hour later, and said, Jonathan, it's, it's really bad. We, we actually we think it's cancer. And the, the tests are leading us to think that it's pancreatic cancer. And I didn't know much about cancer, but I did know pancreatic cancer is one of the especially dangerous kinds. And... Uh, and it, it came out that it was stage four, that it was pretty late, because it, it often you don't see the signs of pancreatic cancer until it's later stages. And at that point, there's not much you can do. So they gave a diagnosis to say, you really don't have much time. And my dad was 56 years old. This was my last semester in seminary, and they had just moved from St. Louis to Colorado Springs, like four or five months before that. And so I get that call, and my last semester of school, uh, in seminary, you know, thinking about a job search and finishing school and all the excitement of that was just obliterated. You know, my plans for succeeding in, in class, they just changed. And I realized, oh man, in order to walk with God right now, to be faithful to my family and to love them well and to walk with my dad, I'm going to have to set aside my plans for school. Like, I'm not going to, I can't do as well with my classes. I just don't have the bandwidth and uh, you kind of go into survival mode to say, what do I need to do? So we spent some time traveling back and forth out to Colorado Springs and spending time with my dad. And uh, he died uh, a little under seven weeks after he was diagnosed. He was diagnosed at the end of September, and he died a week before Thanksgiving uh, at the age of 56. And his life was cut short just like that. I, I, I'm thankful I had seven weeks with him, talked to him all the time on the phone, and got to visit him. There's some really sweet time, some really painful time, uh, knowing that life was short, and we were able to make it meaningful, the conversations that we had. But um, just like that, he was taken from us, and his life was short. He wasn't planning on that. Uh, none, no one in our family was planning on that. But as James says, life, it's... It's a mist, it's a vapor, it just poof, it can disappear. And my, my father's a believer, he's with the Lord, he's having a much better day than any of us are today. I'm thankful for that. But I'm, I'm left here picking up the pieces. And you guys are too. You've lost loved ones, you've had really tragic things happen in your life, and we're left trying to pick up the pieces and make sense of that in, in the short time that we have. But... Um, it's those sort of moments that remind us of priorities and values. And they, they, in those moments, God meets us and says, we need to reshape and rethink the way we're doing life because it's a mist. Just poof. It, it can disappear. Um, so James, he, he challenges us. We, he says, we need to think about the future, but, but there's this key phrase we need to add to say, if the Lord wills, 
in verse 15 or 16, and specifically about financial plans for a profit. You have to say, uh, and say, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you are just boasting in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So James, he isn't condemning planning, but he's condemning planning from a making a financial gain and wealth and investment, doing it from a position of arrogance and saying, I can do this on my own effort with my own plans, and I got this. And James is saying, no, 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 no. You have to say if the Lord wills. He's the one who ultimately gives you the ability, the time, the energy to bring this about. To bring this about. You know, we live in our culture, we prize autonomy, like, which is self-government. Like you have control of yourself and you do this all yourself. We prize self-determination. Like you determine your own destiny. You know, we say the phrase, you do you. <laughs> That's what it means. It's self-determining. You, you get to decide your own meaning in life. We live in a culture that values self-indulgence and luxury and living uh, and especially self-exploration, saying you need to look inside yourself, explore your heart, all that you want, and whatever's in your heart, act on it. Just anyone, you can decide what you want for yourself. Just look in your heart and do it. As long as it's a sincere act from the heart, there's nothing wrong with it. That's what our culture says. It's a self-determining aspect. And James is saying, no, that, that's, we're doing this from a position of human arrogance. And, and, and it leads to problems because you and me, we all decide different things for ourselves. And at some point, what I want imposes upon what you want. And it, it leads to conflict and brokenness. And it doesn't go to good places. But that's the way we live life here in, in our culture. Uh, self-exploration, self-government, self-determination. But we do so from a position of human arrogance. And that's what James is going after today, saying that boasting, that arrogance, it's evil. It's wicked. Um, and I think here he's talking to Christians, and he's calling them to repent. He's saying, guys, I, I expect you to be able to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. He's speaking to um, Christians making plans and efforts, and he's saying, this is evil. We need to turn from it. And then he closes it in verse 17 by saying, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. And at first, this statement kind of seems a little out of place. You're kind of like, where's that coming from? But he's driving home a really important point here. Uh, one way of talking about sin or disobeying God, turning from God, living our own ways, is we, we sometimes divide it up into two, two categories of sin. There's sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission or when you choose to do something that God said, don't do this. Don't commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, don't do these things. And then we do them, and then there's consequences. We break God's law, we do it. The wrong things that we do, we shouldn't do, but we do it, and then it's wrong. That's sins of commission. And he says there's sins of omission. And sins of omission, are, on the other hand, are when you omit to do something that you should do. There's a good thing you should do, but you don't do it. And that's sin, too. They're both sin. They're both bad. But uh, this is a sin of omission to say, uh, as James said earlier, to tell a poor person, hey, be warm and filled. May God's blessing be upon you. But then to not help them. There's something good you should have done, but you didn't do it. And that's, that's a problem. It's bad. It's sin. And here, James is saying, what, what we're talking about now, boasting from a position of human arrogance, he's saying, this is a sin of commission now. It was wrong before, but now you know. Now you have no excuse to make plans without saying that the Lord wills. It, you, you don't have uh, an excuse anymore saying, well, I didn't know. No, he's saying sinful self-determination out of human arrogance is bad, destructive, wrong, and we have to address it, specifically with how we pursue wealth. So a few thoughts kind of in closing application for this little section, James. He, I think he still encourages us to make plans, but he, he says don't assume that your plans are God's plans and that your values with your plans match up with God's values. Plan, go for it, but hold it lightly. Hold it loosely. Say, if the Lord wills. And secondly, I think James says, recognize we must recognize the temporary nature of our present life. It's a mist. It can just disappear and we cannot be just living for tomorrow and living for the future 
We have to live in the present and to figure out how to follow Jesus here and now. That's a mark of maturity, to have your priorities and, sh- and actions shaped by the limitations of knowing life could just be gone. What does it look like to live life today? And then third, uh, I think James is asking us the question, do you boast in your own ability to do things? Whether it's your job or school or your marriage, or, do you do this on your own strength or, or from the guidance of the Lord? Do you turn to him or do you just do this all out of your own desires and wills and priorities? Or does God have anything to say about the way you're living life? Uh, so ultimately, James is saying here, human arrogance when we do it this way, we're denying God. We're saying, God, you don't matter. I'm going to live my, my life my way. And James is saying, no, that's destructive. And we're denying God. And ultimately, we're destroying other people. Now, James is going to turn to talk about how human arrogance also leads us to self-indulgence. To talk about uh, luxury and pursuing comforts excessively, especially. And uh, in this next section, James 5, 1 to 6, he's pretty strong. He comes across differently to this group of people, and uh, it, it's bad news. So uh, if you like bad news, this is good news for you, <laughs> but this is bad news. It, and he's going to turn to address a new group of people uh, that I, well, well, we'll just dig into it. James continues in verse 1, 5, 1. He says, come now, pay attention, listen up, you rich people. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers you mow, who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, they are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters, they have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. And you have fattened your heart in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person, and he does not resist you. And this, these are really strong words here. This, is, this isn't just like a call to repentance. This is him like the prophets in the Old Testament saying, there is judgment coming right here and now against the pursuit of selfish indulgence. So he says, come now, listen up, you rich person, you rich people. And uh, here, specifically as we read on through the passage, we see that he's talking to wealthy landowners. He's saying you had people working for you, working your fields, mowing your fields, and you were defrauding them. You weren't paying them. You were oppressing them. And uh, in the ancient world, you know, sometimes we think about feudalism where you had someone who kind of oversaw a bunch of land and a bunch of people worked for him, that that came about in the Middle Ages. But it really didn't. It, it has been going on for a long time. And you had a rich person who came in and they bought a bunch of land, but then they would rent it out to uh, tenants and people would work the land. Uh, but if you were the rich person, if you were the landowner, you could set the terms. You could come in and make profit and buy the land and extort people, and there was not much they could do about it. In similar ways, it's, it's similar to what's happening in Haiti, where the, the prices keep getting jacked up, and they don't know how to live because they have to choose between buying gas and buying food. And they're, they're at the mercy of the people who have the money and the power, and that's what James is going after here. He's saying there's wealthy, rich people who are oppressing the poor people in James's church. Uh, and he comes on really strong, like his tone has shifted here, right? This isn't just, hey, if the Lord wills, do this or that. You know, this is, this is strong here. Weep and howl. Miseries are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Gold and silver corroded. Their corrosion will be evidence against you. You're storing up treasure for the last day. You fatten your heart for the day of slaughter. I mean, it's, he's on the attack here. Uh, he's announcing prophetic judgment upon the wealthy people who are oppressing the poor people in this community. So this, I think, leads us to see a different person than just like the Christian business person. I think he is speaking to the wealthy landowners who are oppressing the Christians, and he's saying God is opposed to this. He, he will not stand for it. Uh, so this is kind of a rhetorical way of speaking 
Uh, it's called apostrophe, and it's when you're speaking to a present group of people by, about someone else who's not present for the benefit of the people who are here. So he's writing to this group of Jesus followers in, uh, in ancient Palestine who are suffering. There's trials upon them. Rich people are oppressing them, and they don't know what to do about it. And he's saying, I am going to give you a message from God of judgment on those people who are oppressing you, and it's going to bring comfort to you because you know God will not stand to watch the rich, the powerful, the people of higher status oppressing those, frauding those, cheating those who are below them. God is not happy. God will do something. So God stands in opposition to those who oppress others, um, and especially because they're living a life of self-indulgence and luxury. That's what they want. The people with power, they want self-indulgence, luxurious living, and that's what they're after. But James says their riches have rotted. Their clothes are moth-eaten. So they got a bunch of clothes. They got a giant closet, and it's filled with clothes, and they don't even wear it. So moths, bugs, things are filling it up, and they're just kind of getting eaten away, kind of eroding a little bit by little bit. That's what's happening. And he says their gold has become corroded, which is interesting because if we, what we know about gold, it doesn't really tarnish or, or corrode like this, like it lasts. It's one of the qualities of gold. But James is saying the wealth that they're pursuing, in God's eyes, it's, it's actually corroded. It's tarnished. It doesn't have eternal value and worth, and they're pursuing this self-indulgence, this life of luxury. And James says, you actually need to weep and howl because this is not good. The way you're going about getting wealth and oppressing people to do it, extorting people, cheating people, stealing from people in order to do it. They're hoarding wealth. They're hoarding it. So he says, behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, you kept back from by fraud, they're crying out against you. The wages are crying out. The, the, from their, uh, the heart and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So they've cheated their workers, and James personifies their paycheck. And he says, their paycheck or lack of paycheck, it's crying out. It, it's empty, their pockets are empty, and those are crying out to God. And the cries of the laborers who you've cheated uh, and, and made gain by prop. By, by um, fraud. He says they've reached the Lord of hosts. This is a phrase, I, it's all through the Bible. I didn't really understand it for a long time. I thought like Lord of hosts, like the hosts at Applebee's, like the Lord of all the hosts and hostesses, and that's what the Lord of hosts means. Um, you know, I'm like, what, is, what does it mean? Well, a host is an army. It's a, a military group. And if you're the Lord of hosts, you're the commander in chief. You're the commander of the army. He's the Lord of the armies. And James says, the cries of the oppressed have reached the commander and his armies. And he stands in opposition to the, to the oppression that you are doing. So God's heart, it is for the oppressed. God stands against those who oppress others and his heart is for the oppressed. And I think James here is drawing from a really important Old Testament passage in the book of Deuteronomy. I think this is in the back of his mind. It, there's even some similarities in the words that he uses. It's in Deuteronomy 24, 14 to 15. This is Moses giving God's law to um, ancient Israel. And he says, You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy. You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners, one of the aliens, one of the resident aliens, who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor, and he counts on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord, and you be guilty of sin. Moses is saying, equal time, equal pay, equal compensation is a part of God's desire to see people who are, are oppressed, who are, are laborers, we need to treat people fairly. And if you don't, the cries will, lead, will, will be heard by the Lord. Um, there's a lot of sermons we could do on this passage, right, uh, to talk about equal pay. You know, there's a huge disparity and distance between how we pay men and women in our culture. It's sad for the same job. 
Uh, there's, there's, there's distance there. Same thing with how we pay people for different, of different ethnicities and for different jobs. It, it's, these are issues we really have to think through because Moses is saying God does not want us to mistreat other people and pe- treat people differently based on these issues. No, we need to have equal pay and compensation appropriately, um, regardless of race, nationality, marital status, all of that. Another key element, just to, to think about, we, we need to think this through deeper. He says that this also needs to be true for the brother or sister in your land, the, the people who live here, and also for the, the sojourner, the foreigner who lives in your lands, who works. You need to treat them fairly as well. And that's something that's really challenging for us to think through because people who are resident aliens often are the victims of oppression, often uh, suffer a lot of injustices. And it's complicated because uh, some are here illegally, but only some. Only some. A lot aren't. So we really need to think through God's heart to care for people who are poor, who are oppressed, who are suffering injustices. That's, there's more we could talk about there, but um, James, I think, is drawing from this to say if you are in a position of power, status, authority, you need to be treating those under you uh, fairly from, uh, from a biblical perspective in a godly way. Because when you live off of a daily wage, this is why Moses says pay him the end of that day, that's what you have to live on. Like, you got to go buy food or bread or go fix your, pay for something to fix your house, I don't, fix your car, whatever. When you live day by day, you need the money by the end of the day. You can't just say, yeah, I'll pay you later or whatever, and not follow through on that because in, in their world that you didn't have bank accounts like you and me have, you weren't able to store up enough daily bread for the next day. It was hard. So you need to pay here and now. And so James is saying, similarly to Moses, that when the rich landowners were oppressing the poor people in James's community um, for their greed and oppression, he's saying you're depriving these people of living. You're depriving these people of their means of surviving. In essence, you're taking their life from them. He, he says, you've condemned and murdered the righteous person. That that's really what's happening. You're taking the life of other people when you do this. So God will not stand for people who are in power to oppress the poor. And God's heart is near to the oppressed. And we'll see next week, James is going to turn to those who have been suffering who have been undergoing these trials. This is where he's going to go next to encourage those to continue uh, to be patient, to, to seek the Lord's justice, and to, to hold on. That's next week, though. This week, he, he's just saying to the rich, wealthy landowners who are oppressing people, that you're fattening your heart for the day of slaughter, that there is judgment coming upon you. It's really strong words. It's really strong words. But he's saying the Lord is against them, and he's trying to afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. That's why he's giving this message. And uh, he's saying the Lord will not let this injustice go on forever. It's happening, and it is ongoing. But he's saying the Lord intervenes. It, it's not always till the last day, but even here and now he intervenes. And so he gives this message. We're talking like the, the mid-50s probably. Well, 10 or 15 years later, remember we're in the winds of war. There's this... Jewish uprising and revolting against the powers, the Roman authorities. Well, 10, 15 years later, the Roman authorities came in and they, they burned it all down. They destroyed everything. They destroyed the temple in 70 AD, and it was just massive destruction. And the Jewish aristocracy, the like wealthy people who were in control, were basically obliterated. And it's just all wiped out. And so James's Judgment here, he said, it's, it's going to happen. Like, God will not stand for the oppressed people to suffer injustice forever. He, he will intervene. Uh, so he, he announces this message of judgment to comfort the people who are in the church who have been struggling. So if you have been oppressed, if you're struggling, if you, uh, are, you feel downtrodden, the Lord has a heart for you, and he knows what you're going through. And God, he, he doesn't stand for human arrogance that leads, feeds self-indulgence. Um, so a few closing thoughts of application on this passage. It's, it's a hard passage for us. James, his first and primary 
application is to de denounce the wealthy people who are oppressing others and living a life of self-indulgence. Whether they've gained money by fraud or theft, to live in luxury, James says, God will not stand for it if you're oppressing other people. So Christians, you need to stand with people who have been broken and beaten down and give people a voice who don't have a voice. You need to help people who are not helped to protect people who are not protected. Um, yeah, so his denunciation is upon wealthy people who are abusing their wealth, who are going after it in ungodly ways. So I, I think it would be wrong to say all wealthy people, anyone who has money, you're condemned. That's not what James is doing. He, he's speaking to people who are pursuing wealth in ungodly ways and using it in ungodly ways. At the same time, though, James is reminding us of the dangers of money and dangers of the pursuit of possessions. He's reminding us there, there's a risk here. There's an enticing draw that we feel towards nice things, to luxury, to comfort, to put our security there. And he's saying, we need to beware. We need to be very careful and live a life of contentment. And I think ultimately this leads us to ask this question. When do we have too much? When do we have too much? Too much stuff, too much money, too much possession, too much power, influence, whatever. When do you have too much? When is your house too big? When is your car too nice? Uh, I don't know. I can't answer that for you. But James is saying we have to be wary of the dangers and we have to ask the question uh, about wealth, about pursuit of wealth, because often human arrogance is at the heart of it. And it disregards God. It destroys others. So our path forward is to live a life of godly humility that recognizes our human limitations and helps us overcome the seductive power of wealth. It overcomes self-determination and self-indulgence. And uh, he's saying you, we have to live a life that honors God with our planning, with our use of wealth, to care for the poor, the oppressed, which is a major theme we've seen in James. Uh, and all of this is because we follow a God who gave up riches, who gave up power and authority and position, and he came in the person of Jesus as a, as a human being with limitations to suffer injustice, to spend time with the downtrodden, the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the people who are outcasts, who are unliked. God gave up his position of authority, power, status, the wealth being king. He gave it up. Now, he was exalted, he was lifted up, and we praise him for that, but we praise him for the humility that he has shown to give up riches in order to bless others, to make a way for you and me to become right with God. That's the gospel. That's the good news, because we, we couldn't save ourselves, and we needed God to enter in now into our life and find a way to make things right, to give up riches, to become poor, in order for you and me to become rich in grace. That's our God. That's our God, and it's an amazing thing. And because that's who he is, it shapes who you and me need to be, how we use our wealth, money, and to really ask deep questions about our hearts and all of this. So let's take a moment to pray, to reflect. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for uh, entering into our world by sending Jesus to come and to give up riches and luxury and to not live a life of self-indulgence, but to live a life of self-denial, to sacrifice for the good of others and to not use power to oppress, but to use power to lift up others and to protect others. We thank you for who you are. And we ask that you would come and guide our hearts as we think through our pursuit of wealth and riches or comfort or security, because so often the stuff in our heart is impure. We need you to shape our motives, our actions, and to draw us closer to you. Uh, so Lord, use James's message to guide us, to challenge us, to encourage us, and help us to, to see your heart and to live a life that reflects your heart and your values. We pray this all in your name, Jesus.